Hey everyone, welcome to Time Sensitive. This week, Andrew's in conversation with the British art director and graphic designer, Peter Saville. What'd you talk with him about? So we covered a lot of ground as actually a note to our audience. This is a, a bit of a longer episode than we normally <laughs> do, but well worth it. We made attempts to cut, but couldn't really find too much to take out. He's incredibly articulate and has a long story to tell. I mean, we're talking about a five decade career that has been massively influential. He's a force. I mean, this is a cultural history episode, really. You know, for the uninitiated, Peter is a cult legend in the field of design and music. He co-founded Factory Records. He's the visual engine behind some of the most influential album covers, Joy Division, Unknown Pleasures, New Order's Power, Corruption, and Lies. If you're wondering where so much of the visual culture of the last decade comes from, you really should be looking at Peter's early work. So we talk a bit about that, his journey to now, but also how he's very much in the renaissance of his career at this moment. He's been doing some extraordinary identity work. He had this incredible collaboration with Kvadrat, which is why he was in town. His first foray into textiles, which comes from a very personal place, which was interesting. There's a lot there. I'm excited to share it. It was so great to have him in the studio and can't wait to listen to this. Before we get into it, though, we'd first like to thank our season six sponsor, Le Col School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. What's so special about Le Col is that they take the rarefied world of jewelry and make it accessible through courses, conferences, exhibitions, videos, and book publications. Really, at its heart, the organization is about a celebration of craft and a novel way of looking at the world through the lens of jewelry. I've been involved with them since 2014 and over the years have learned so much through the exhibitions I've seen and talks I've listened in on or been a part of, from subjects such as slow design about nature, time, and making, to the immaculate work of the artist, jewelry maker, and metalsmith Daniel Brush, who has also been a guest on Time Sensitive. We're so thrilled to be working with LeCole through season six this fall, and we look forward to sharing more about all of their programming and projects in the episodes to come. You can find out more about Le Cole at www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And now, here's Andrew and Peter. So there's a lot to talk about after a half century of work behind you. Yeah, almost. It is almost half a century. Which is amazing. And I'm going to need to be selective here, but I wanted to start with Zeitgeist. Yes. And the sort of mood of the moment. Yeah. So to you right now, I know you're visiting New York, you live in England. What's the mood to you of the moment? <sighs> right now and actually for recent in recent years i found it very difficult to ascertain this notion of zeitgeist was really important to me and i remember distinctly remember how thrilled i was probably around about the time that i started school which would be like 74 i remember being really thrilled to discover this word zeitgeist you know it's not a term that I'd grown up with in any sense. And and in a book somewhere one day when I was quite young, let's say 20 years of age, I saw this word, this German word, zeitgeist. And I was just like, man, cool. <laughs> it was a great sounding term. And what does it mean? And it was like spirit of the times. <sighs> I was... I was so kind of moved, excited, pleased, reassured to find that there was a term, a kind of cultural term for what mattered to me more than anything else. It was the one thing that in my teens I'd have cared about. It was the kind of pulse beat that I was trying to connect with. And seeing this term for it made me appreciate that it was a serious issue, that it was a thing. Right. That other people, that 
culture, society recognized this as a thing, the spirit of the moment. And so that was a really a momentous discovery that there was a term for what mattered to me. All the way through that time, late 70s, 80s, across the kind of analog digital divide into the 90s, I felt like I was tracking something. It was about tracking something, this feeling of nowness. And I was able to track it. Absolutely. But, you know, and I would take the readings from across the sectors, across the whole spectrum, which I'd like to say my friend now, Jack Self, termed the big flat now, a couple of years ago in O32 magazine. Jack described the new converged landscape as the big flat now, which I thought was a great way to put the cross-pollination that's happened between all the disciplines. And I was tracking it until, probably until around about the millennium break, so into early 2000s. And over the last 20 years, it's become increasingly impossible to track any sense of nowness. It's a sort of, it's pluralist to the point of atomization. The paths that you used to follow are now almost disconnected, almost atomized. Which is maybe why it's so hard to know what's coming. Exactly. Because there'll be something coming that you expect, but there'll be a hundred other things coming that you didn't expect. It is now disconnected. So there's everybody is doing something everywhere all the time. The relevant concern is whether that any of it matters. And as I've gotten older and a kind of a sense of socio-political awareness has become like part of my being, I'm really not that concerned about a lot of the things that I used to be concerned about. But you are still massively intersectional. I mean, science, fashion, politics, maybe not so much fashion. Yeah, anymore, within, but... within reason. I mean, fashion actually is still like a cornerstone of things that I'm doing. You know, this year I've done another fashion identity. In fact, it went live this week for Ferragamo. Mm -hmm. So literally today I got sent a post about, oh, the press release is out for Ferragamo. Yeah, you've done more fashion in the last... Yeah few years than you've done in a long time. In identity, in, in what we might kind of call graphic identity, the fashion world has been very good to me. You know, in a way that didn't happen, you know, even in the 90s. Yeah. It's all happened in the last 10 or 15 years. So basically in my 50s and onwards is when the sort of work that, that I thought was due to me, it's really only in the last decade or so that it's actually come. But it's very nice that it has come because, you know, I have to pay the rent, so it's exactly. good. But this idea, this issue of trying to follow things is just really difficult now. And also, with a backdrop of fundamental socio-political change and disruption in our comfortable world, there's a lot of things seeming, you know, like, and not exactly that important to me anymore. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. You do have this instinctively reductive, serious way of doing design. Yeah. And it always seemed to be layered with reference connection points from your own curiosities. Yes, totally. And so I guess in that way, what are you most curious about now? Well, I was very curious about the James Webb telescope a few months ago, but now it's almost like, you know, just there now. Just um, pretty pictures. I am 67 next month. There's a, an enormous amount of work in like in my archival background. Yeah. There's a lot of things that have never been seen. A kind of a tip of the iceberg type scenario. So this is actually work to a great intent actually done. So not work to do yet. It's not like ideas yeah. unrealized. You know, I have books, notes full of unrealized ideas, but there's a significant amount of, I've actually realized, but never seen. And that's been a concern for a few years mm. because I want to address some of that whilst I still have the energy and the wits to do it. Yeah. But the circumstances to make that possible are not easy to pull together, but there's some progress. Right. Dealing with my own history is something that I would like to make some progress on 
sooner rather than later. Yeah. And maybe with a little bit of that out of the way, then I could think about, is there something I would like to do now? There was a project in the early 2000s that I did with my partner, Anna Blessman, and we had a project called Swing. And that was another kind of prematurely curtailed project. We were not able to pursue it. And we talk about it sometimes. And there was a huge amount of things, undone things within the kind of landscape of concepts we had around swing. There's a lot of things I would like to do. Yeah. The thing is, is that once you get into your mid 60s, you realize that the sand is running out. Hmm. And uh, you got a while to go. I mean, you, you do, but but you don't know how long you have to go. Right. Which is not that's true at any point in any time for any person. Anything yeah. can happen. But once you begin to get older, you know that it's now a thing. That's actually a thing. Yeah. So it's not going to be a chance accident that comes your way. It's just like it's life, is, life is coming your way. So that makes me, at least me, feel a little bit selective about what hasn't been done yet. So there's a lot that I would like to do. And there's a lot, a lot of the already started, but not finished. Right. In a way, that seems the most pressing. And from that, maybe move on to some of the other things. But there's also a lot of things, Andrew, that, I mean, there's a lot that I haven't done. And on reflection, it's a good job I didn't do it. I mean, that I procrastinate a lot, you know, so I'm still trying to decide what to do whilst other people have finished. But then they also do a lot of stuff that maybe they should have thought a little bit more about before doing. So at least I... <laughs> At least I haven't prematurely rushed into stuff that was not such a great idea. Right. So I have that as compensation. Well, I do want to talk about some of your recent work. I mean, you use time in many, many ways. And when I looked at your work through the lens of time, you transpose elements across time and space, especially in your earlier work. And Yeah. But it's not often that there's a kind of personal childhood narrative to it, which brings me to your recent work for Quadrat. Oh, yeah. And... A technicolor. So I want to talk a little bit about how you came to the concept, a little bit about that project. And then I'm curious about some elements personally for you about this sort of integrated mm. visit back, which seems to be from what I can see, kind of the first where you've dealt with a deeply personal. Yeah. The quadrat thing is possibly the most knowingly biographic work. Yeah. The New Order album cover, Power, Corruption, and Lies, from 1983, Three. was perhaps my most biographic work. But I didn't know it when I was doing it. It was only on reflection that I noticed. It was only one day sitting in my mother's living room some years later. I thought, no. Oh. It's just my life story. But I hadn't, that was not a knowing kind of work at the time. I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know how much it was actually quite reflective of me. The front and the back were the sort of two sides of the place where I'd grown up. The Quadrat project was kind of knowingly, but I mean, I knew that it was about my early life. It's a textile collection in wool for Quadrat because wool is what predominantly what Quadrat do. And Quadrat are a particularly lovely company that I've had a relationship with now for nearly 20 years as a art director, consultant, friend of the company, et cetera, et cetera. And over the years, Anders Boreal, who, who runs Quadrat, you know, he's asked me several times to do a collection and actually a product collection for them. And respectfully, I procrastinated about that but mainly because i kind of i knew i didn't know what i was doing right and you have respect for people who do absolutely textile design is one of those things that you kind of look at it and think there's nothing going on but it's actually there is a lot going on and working with quadrat made me appreciative but it's not easy doing that creating a a fabric that somebody is going to live with for years it's not that easy actually it's and it was not something that I, you know, had. I knew I didn't know. So I didn't rush into doing it. And then a, a year or so ago, their new head of design was quite insistent. 
and very supportive. And she said, well, you know, you do have a concept, don't you? And there was a concept I'd talked about with them at the time. She said, let's make it real. And that concept was from childhood observations. Every summer and Easter in my childhood, we would relocate from the Manchester area in the northwest of England over to the coast in North Wales. So I spent every summer in North Wales and a lot of time on a farm with a, a friend. You know, I'd like a, made friends there. I was there every summer, made friends. And, and one of the families I made friends with had a farm and I would go just hang out on the farm, you know, for like 10, 11 years of age. The actual farm buildings, later they became the annex of a hotel. And I would stay at the hotel. Oh, wow. When I went to visit my late mother. My father had died. My mother was in a retirement apartment without spare rooms. So I would stay at the hotel. And of course, I wanted to stay at, at this hotel, which is where I'd spent time as a child. It was like deeply nostalgic feeling. And even though the farm buildings had become a hotel, the land around it was still managed by the childhood friend's family. And so my childhood friend, Justin, was now the farmer who managed the land. I drive up through the parkland to the hotel and look at the sheep and think they're my, they're my friend's sheep. <laughs> and, you know, and over the years, I noticed the markings on the sheep. And sometimes I would just park the car and look at them and just kind of reflect on childhood and like how much There's life changes. There's a weird changes. name to them. Well, there was a particular type called Swaledale, but these were regular Welsh mountain kind of sheep. But the thing that was interesting was the markings on them which I kind of understood they would like ownership. Mark is the, the flock is owned by a particular farmer or whatever, and that he has a mark. But over the years, the markings just seemed to get kind of looser and more abstract. And I just sat there thinking, this is like graffiti. This is just like spray graffiti on these animals. And then other colors seemed to creep in as well. So it became like a sort of abstract kind of graffiti project in motion through the landscape. And it was just more pertinent to me because they were my friend's sheep. And I just sat there thinking, what is he spraying on there? And then the relationship with Quadra made me a little bit more observant and thoughtful about wool. And of course, I couldn't help thinking that I liked these abstract graffiti marks. And what if they made their way through the industrial process to a finished wool textile? I mean, obviously, I realized that they were washed and bleached out along the way. But what if they weren't? So this was the concept that I put to Quadrat. Let's imagine that these markings, which come from a very rigid set of colors, the six colors that they use seem to use worldwide, the same six colors. What if these colors were indelible? And they were mixed in randomly with the natural wool. And then you wove the cloth. What would happen? You'd get this kind of, these sort of a memory of this color and you would get these stray filaments. And perhaps that might be kind of interesting. A sort of subliminal presence of what I call pop pastoral. And so Quadra took on the challenge to make that happen, which of course I couldn't have done, you know, like I, you know, I didn't know, I mean, I had no idea how to go about this, but Quadra did. And it was actually, it was not easy. In the end, it involved the mixing up of a ton. One ton. Uh, one ton of natural wool was required for the colored strands to become equally distributed in the mass so as to be randomized. What we didn't want to have was like ungainly patches of blue or orange and then nothing for another five meters, you know. So basically it needed to intermingle across the whole thing. So there was a constant presence, like a microcosm of color woven into the neutral background. And that required a ton of wool to be mixed together. Anyway, they got there in the end and started to produce these really beautiful results. And I was... I was delighted. All the I way mean, to sheer yeah. curtains, which kind of had Then this... there was like, oh, we can do this with it. And there were these remarkable sheer curtains that started to come sampled through. Some with singular colors, 
but others, one in particular with a spectrum fade, which kind of looks like a print, but it's not a print. Yeah. It's individual strands of, of color, which are then... Which pick up light. Which pick up the light and then transition from color to color through the distribution of strands. So they're singular strands. So there's a lot of pink strands and then they give way to yellow ones in the middle and then there's more yellow Very ones. Very beautiful. So it's actually a really, really beautiful. For me, it was like, a, I mean, it's always quite exciting when you get a proof back from artwork that you've done. But this was more than that because this was a thing coming back. I had no idea how it would come out. And so the sort of design industrial process at Quadrat created these brilliant things. And then we moved on and did rugs and they went another way. They were more evident. There's one rug particularly that I like, which is like kind of terrazzo in wool. And there's another more kind of tactile one that I called Flock, which has got a kind of 60s wall hanging sculptural feel. So there's the curtain, there's the textile fabric, and there's the rugs. And they all explore exactly the same idea, this idea of six colors, which are used in the industry of agriculture, making their way through to something that we can then, we can live with on an everyday basis. And I like that. I like this idea that it's kind of like from field to home or space. Quite like that idea. What struck me, well, it definitely closes the divide of nature and home. Yes. And sort of an anti- kind of enlightenment idea of us and them. It's yeah. it's a more integration of nature and human. But what I was amazed by when I really thought about this was how it seemed to be the first project that you went all the way to your youth mm. and childhood to draw from, but also integrated almost every theme throughout your work in terms of coding through color, systems yeah. of industry, a pairing of nature and industry, of man and nature, a sort of husbandry. Yeah. I mean, Andrew, that's nice of you to see it that way. There is a coding aspect, which I didn't realize till later. In fact, we've made a film to support this just to show the, you know, to show people this, the process of the sheep being sprayed. And it was, was that film was being made that I learned that they use these extra bits of color to indicate the kind of wellness of the sheep and whether they've been vaccinated for this, that, or whether they've had COVID or whatever. Right. So that, and I realized, oh, there's a coding system. So there's the key ownership mark, but then there's these other little bits of information about the animal and in yellow or green or red or something like that. And I went, oh God, so this, it has a coding system again. So that aspect of a familiarity with my work was like unexpected and chance. The other thing is you get to know at some point who you are. I mean, I didn't know who I was when I was young. I know what I wanted to do, but I couldn't necessarily have explained that or accounted for it. But then I was not called upon to account for it. And I think that's one of the differences between experience in the applied arts and in fine art. With a fine art education, it is necessary to account for yourself. Oftentimes earlier than you might know. Yeah. And maybe before you've even done anything or even had a chance to do anything. And we do see a number of very smart people in fine art who are very good at accounting for themselves. Sometimes they're better at accounting for themselves than perhaps even producing. And oddly, in the applied arts, really nobody ever asks why. They want to know what you're going to do, but they're not really interested in why. And particularly with the communication design and graphics, it's very about what because it's for them. Predominantly, it is for them. It's not for you. I mean, in my case, I have an exception to that, which is very unusual. That's the work with factory. But nobody even asked why then. I mean, Tony Wilson sometimes would ask me why. That's in, you know, out of interest. So I never had to explain myself in the early decades, even. For 20 years, I never had to explain myself. And so it was not until I began to reflect on what I had done and ask myself, why did I do that? And increasingly have to do interviews or 
be questioned about the work that I began to think about what I was doing. And then you begin to see who you are. And you're right, the transposition of ideas from a sector to sector, from let's say the industrial to the cultural, that interests me. The transposition across time. These are all things that I did do. But they're an aggregate. Yeah, I did them instinctively because I wanted to. Right. I never was able to sit down and say that, but now I see it. Which might be why there's a certain authenticity to it, which resonated with people. Possibly, yes. I mean, they say like, you know, this idea of vision, like, well, it's an aggregate of your responses. Like, how consistently have you responded over time? I mean, it's nice and reassuring to me. If somebody who has had time to observe or think about work that I've done more than just one work and to see that it's great. It's actually great when somebody says, you know, you do this, you know, and sometimes they, you are familiar with what they say and you say, thank you. That's nice. And sometimes they say, sometimes they say something which actually you hadn't thought of at all. And that's, fascinating and you add that a little bit to your kind of the palette of this repertoire of understanding yourself so all of that happens that's who you are so i know what i'm like now and with this technicolor collection yes it's uh it resonates with my childhood but it's that's then been expressed in the ways that I normally express things, but it does have that. And that's not very often that I have a piece of work like that. So I can sit on a chair that's got this fabric on it and my feet on a rug that's coming from the same concept. And it'll take me back to being 10 years old on a field in North Wales. And that's actually quite nice. Not much of my work does that. Now that we're already going back there, what was yeah. your family like? I mean, I knew you grew up north of England in the 60s. You weren't exposed to a ton of creative careers. No, it was a middle class, north of England kind of middle class. My father was very good to us. I had two brothers. I was the youngest of three boys. And he was very good to us. Better than we realized. Or let's say I won't speak for my brothers, but better than I realized until I was much later. It was not until dad died and my mother and I realized that (laughs) they'd spent all of the money. He spent the money that he made setting up the family as well as he could. So not on himself. You know, he always wanted a sailing boat and he never had one. But I know where the money went. Went on me and my brothers. And, you know, we lived in a good house, in a good neighborhood. I had a good family life. I mean, it was cultured to a limited extent. It was a kind of classic, British bourgeois middle class kind of background. There was like what you call brown furniture in the house, antique furniture that was reasonably good. And there were reasonably good 19th century oil paintings and watercolors around, but nothing modern. It was decidedly not modern. And I was very envious of friends who had younger parents with a more modern sort of 60s. Yeah way of life i would go sometimes to a friend's house and think oh, wow it's so exciting here so again it was not until later that i was able to appreciate the things that i was brought up with i was considered the smarter one of the three boys and so the usual middle class pressure was there to go be a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant or something like that. and of course you know I, willfully i didn't want to do that you know i often think there was something very important about being born in 1955 in tandem with pop music it's in tandem with pop it's almost like the birth of pop yeah and obviously the first few years don't matter that much but my mother used to remind me that as an infant i liked elvis i mean i don't know i don't know how i liked it but she said you would always respond if elvis was on the radio but the key thing is that through the 60s between the age of five and 15 I didn't take part, but I witnessed it. You don't notice much at five, but seven, eight, nine, ten, towards that. And between five and 15, you do notice the world. And I had two older brothers who were also access points. So I witnessed the 60s. And I was not part of it, but I had a bit of a formative reading of what it was. And that was a very important decade. 
an astonishing important decade in so many ways. And so I kind of, I noticed it. The irony was that the age of 15, just as I was old enough to go to the party, it was all over. <laughs> there was a decidedly morning after feeling in the early 70s. So there was a kind of malaise in the early 70s. What was the first concert you saw? It's really interesting conflation, the first concert I went to. I was 14. And the headline act were Blind Faith, the first of the supergroups. Mm -hmm. I think Ginger Baker from Cream was in Blind Faith. But I went to see the support act. And that was a guy called David Bowie. who had a single in the chart. I was 14. He had a single in the chart. It's called Space Oddity. And my friend Mike Nichols and I, we went to see David Barry. I knew who Blind Faith were. You know, my older brother Nicholas was a, like a big fan. I don't think we stayed for Blind Faith. We went to see David Barry. You know, at that time, David Barry was, was there as a fundamental formative influence for anybody who wanted to pay attention. What we were to learn from David Bowie in the coming years was that you could create yourself, that you could create a persona. We saw him do it. And we also saw that in the fast-moving culture of pop, you might have to reinvent that persona, that one thing would not be enough anymore, and that Life might be in process. So permanently in process to the changing circumstances around you. And David Barry was, you know, in a way, the, my first professor in how one might go forward into this next decade, this decade of the 70s. And, Dystopian morning after vibe. Yeah. Which was still in morning after vibe. But so what then comes, I mean, you know, I actually see the 70s as a kind of rather premature or early, what they call fin de siècle for the 20th century there's always this rather melancholic period towards the end of a century that they refer to as fin de siècle, where there's an uncertainty about the future. And obviously in the 70s, there was an uncertainty about the future because there'd been this remarkably future-facing decade, the 60s, some of which had been successful, but a lot of which hadn't. There'd been a lot of casualties from the wonderful drugs that were around. There were a lot of problems from the sexuality that was around. A lot of the plastic furniture broke and the waterbed leaked. So, so much of, in a way, that a lot of the promise and the hope of the 60s, a lot of it kind of, you know, the wheels came off a little bit. Similar to what we're experiencing right now. Well, indeed, you can see these things cyclical. Yeah. And, of course, what occurs at that time is, in a way, the first iteration of postmodernism, which is a reflection on before. A kind of, in this headlong rush forward, did we maybe leave a few things behind? And that is one way of reading the initial phase of postmodernism, which is fundamentally an architectural context. Jenks coined the phrase postmodernism. The weird thing is, and this is the odd thing about time, I felt that. I felt a curiosity about before and a relevance to things that I didn't know about. But without having a philosophical context in which to place that, I would never have said at the age of 20, I am a postmodern individual. Yeah, yeah. But I was interested, if I saw a text about postmodernism, or if I saw an example of postmodernism, I was curious and fascinated. So one of the most important influences in me in the mid, uh, late 70s, was Philip Johnson's AT&T building down the road in this city. I was profoundly taken by the AT&T building because I was beginning to look at classical references, uncertain about their pertinence to the now. And suddenly the godfather of American modernism, Philip Johnson, is proposing, because I saw a book of the proposals for the AT, is proposing a, a New York skyscraper with a broken pediment on top. And this is like a radical proposition in the city of New York. And I saw that, and that reassured me that my own interest in classicism was not misplaced. Backing up a little bit, the group 
in the context of music, the people who mattered to me ultimately more than David Bowie was Roxy Music. Yeah. And Roxy can be understood as a postmodern group, as first postmodern group, where there is a collage of history recontextualized in the then now. Yeah. And all of that was new to me. And this is post art school. Like when were you finding 72. this? 72. It's as I'm entering art school. I go to art school in 74 and Roxy start in 72. I probably buy the second Roxy album in 73 or 74. So I'm kind of instinctively immersed in an interest in things that came before that I was not familiar with and how they might be pertinent to the now, how these things might be recontextualized in the now. I mean, it's just retro. I mean, some of it's not that clever. There was a lot of retro. I mean, it was going on in fashion. It was just a point of how much further you take it. Yeah, people were dressing like Victorian. Exactly. But you once said, I should have never studied graphic design. Yeah, I know. Well, okay. <laughs> You've said that a lot. And I, the reason I bring it up is because I'm curious a level further on that is, was the education in a way from the academic system kind of counter to the idea of the new? Because on one hand, you're interested in learning about the past, but you don't really want to learn the craft of it. No, I, I was interested in signals not necessarily the in-depth of being in immersed in it. The big word after zeitgeist that I learned much, much later was semiotics. Okay, and like that was even more profound. When I learned that there was a word for this thing that I did, how I, what I spoke in, the language of signs and the meaning of those signs and how you might communicate through visual signifiers as semiotics. Mm -hmm. So I was like massively taken by that. I was signposting what I felt mattered. The graphic thing was just that the contemporary visual art that I experienced was on a record sleeve not in a gallery, not in a museum, not in a newspaper or a magazine. You know, the North of England in the 70s was pretty much devoid of any contemporary art evidence. London was. Once I started art school, I would two or three, we would go to London two or three times a year, you know, because I loved being in London. And I would go to Cork Street, which was predominantly like the contemporary gallery street. And there was nothing there except some echoes of the 60s. It was nice to see, you know, some of the 60s pop art. But, you know, we're already like more than a decade afterwards. So, you know. Wasn't relevant. Yeah. You know, interesting, but not like now. There was really no contemporary scene in the UK of art. So there was nothing to actually tangibly relate to. I never met an artist in my life. In fact, Robert Longo was the first active artist that I ever met in my life. And, you know, that was in the early 80s I met Robert. I never met an artist. Imagining to be an artist, I mean, it was more likely to say I'm going to be an astronaut than to be an artist. But the art that I did see that mattered to me, that I could read, that seemed relevant to my wood, it was delivered on a record sleeve. Sometimes it was related to the music, but more often than not, it was like an independent stream of visual thought of its own. And myself and some close friends, we were interested in covers, covers as an end in themselves. We talked about covers. They may or may not be related to an interesting album, but we were aware of record covers. So we talked about covers. We talked about covers the way people would talk about art movements. And as I got into my mid and late teens and still at high school, that's kind of what I wanted to do. And those were the signals that I was giving off myself and a good friend who I was at school with called Malcolm Garrett. We were spending all of our time in the art room, drawing, painting things that looked like record covers. And then you meet Tony Wilson. Yeah, just before we were, fortunately, we had a very smart, young art teacher who saw what we were doing, realized it, what we were interested in, and said, you boys should study graphic design. Oh, so you weren't already studying design? No. Ah. Studied at high school. And we didn't know what graphic design was, but it seemed to be becoming a degree course in what we like doing. 
better than law or medicine or accountancy. So I was able to go home and say, I want to go to, you know, I want to do a degree. Oh, thank God. What in art? Oh, so anyway, <laughs> my father was very tolerant and said, okay, hoping that I would like grow out of it. So Malcolm Garrett and I both went off to art school to study graphic design. We didn't know what graphic design was, but we were intelligent enough to realize quite quickly that it's a profession and it's a service industry. And we both thought, okay, well, the service side of it can wait. We both were certain that when we were like 40, that doing like an airline identity would probably be great when you're a grown up. But right here, right now, we want to make record sleeves. Now, in the period that Malcolm and I were at art school between 74 and 78, there was a coup d'etat in pop culture called punk. 76. 76 punk happened. So the entire order of our culture was turned upside down and handed back to young people. Punk was literally a coup d'etat. Punk was a point when young people took back youth culture, which had become overly kind of corporatized. And in a place that really no longer related to you if you were like 15, 16 or 17 years of age. And so young people took it back. And the incumbent establishment were totally thrown by that for a little while. And in the post-punk moment, certain people decided to do it themselves. And the independent labels started. You know, you know, boys realized that they could form a group without really knowing anything. And other people realized that they could release a record without knowing anything. In Manchester, a significant individual was Tony Wilson. He was actually a, a broadcaster. He was a current affairs broadcaster, but who cared a lot about pop culture and who cared a lot about punk. Tony was of uh, the late 60s generation. He was a little bit older than us. And he saw a kind of sociopolitical voice of expression in punk. And he felt it was important. He actually did not relate to the kind of style era of music that was formative for me. So that Bowie, Roxy, Kraftwerk thing was lost on Tony. He was not interested in that. He was more interested in, in disruption rather than polishing. <laughs> so in Manchester, in 76, 77, Manchester had been a fundamental city location for venues. There, there were venues everywhere, bars, clubs, halls, where punk bands were playing. Kind of post-industrial. Yeah, there was an openness. But punk really did disrupt the status quo and there was establishments concerns about it. And just over time between the Greater Manchester Police and the City Council, they shut down every venue where punk and then the new wave bands were playing. It was as unsettling as rave culture then became in the early 90s, possibly even more so. And suddenly there were no venues. And so this kind of grown up guy from the TV, Tony Wilson, was concerned about that and took it upon himself to find a venue, simple venue. I was at art school, heard he was doing this, went along to Granada TV and sat in the lobby until he came in one day and said, Mr. Wilson, can I do something, please? I hadn't done any work, but I took a book with me that was my copy book at the time, the work of Jan Tischel, this famous Swiss typographer. And Tony thought the things I showed him in the Tisho book looked cool. So he said, yeah, do a poster. So that was the beginning of the factory. So that was in 78. It's my final year at art school. I did the first posters for the factory. I didn't rush off to London immediately, just out of time, just out of procrastination, just out of knowing that I would have to give up the comforts of my home city. And it would be tough in London. I mean, I knew I would go because I wanted to go, I wanted to go to the world. But I put it off a month or so. But this first poster, which I spent a lot yeah. of time looking at Fact before one. this. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible when you look at it in the context of what we've seen in the last sort of 15 years. I mean, this was the first time, I think, that industry mm. and the sort of hazard street signs, the things that we never considered beyond a signal of warning. Functionality. Yeah, were used as an aesthetic. Yeah. I mean, the core influence for it is Tischold's manifesto about type from 1919 called the De Neue Typography, where Tischold makes a statement about the new visual language of the industrial age. So that's, in a way, the core of Fact One, the first first poster. But then there's also this symbol, a use hearing protection symbol, 
which came off a workshop door. I mean, I, I met Tony and he said, we're going to call it the factory, which was, it was nothing more than what kids these days call a night. It was every other Friday for two months. So that was it. Four nights. And he said, the place, the West Indian Centre in Moss Side in Manchester, but we're going to call it the factory. He and his friend, Alan Erasmus, they were just booking some bands to play. And I thought the factory, I thought it was a bit lame because I kind of thought of Warhol and stuff like that. And it was like, uh, even though I loved Warhol and the idea of the factory, we're only a few years later. This is like 78. Right. But actually, it was Alan Erasmus, Tony's friend, who'd said, let's call it the factory because Alan had just constantly seen signs around Manchester saying factory closing. So the deindustrialization of the city. And Alan said, wouldn't it be fun to see something saying factory opening for once? So, so they called it the factory. But it was a gift visually for me. And I went back into art school that afternoon that I'd seen Tony and heard about the factory. And there was a sign on a workshop door that I'd admired. One of the 3D workshop doors had this amazing use hearing protection. They basically put on earplugs before you come in this workshop. That was it. And I'm sitting there thinking, the factory, music venue, sound, use hearing place. <laughs> so I stayed until 8 o'clock that evening because the sign had to come off the door. So so I took the sign, and that was that converged with this aesthetic of Tischold's, this ranged left linear organization of information that was then juxtaposed with this industrial warning sign and that was the beginning of the look of the factory but if you're going to have if you're going to have music venue that's called the factory and if you're going to have a record label called factory i mean you are dealing with you know an industrial aesthetic manchester was the world's first city of industry it actually is the beginning of industry the first factories in history were in manchester manchester was the epicenter of the industrial revolution in the late 18th century Despite not being on the water. Ah, well, that's a very... That's another story. That's a very perceptive comment, Andrew. They were 40 miles from the sea. A characteristic of the city of Manchester, a social characteristic from research is willfulness. It is a very willful place. And a great act of willfulness of the city of Manchester was that as industry developed in the city, they were subservient to their neighboring city, Liverpool, which was the port. And they did not like being subservient to Liverpool. So they brought the North Sea, they brought the ocean to Manchester. They built in the late 18th century, early 19th century, they built the Manchester Ship Canal, a 40 mile canal connecting Manchester, creating the port of Manchester 40 miles inland. That's the willfulness of the city of Manchester. And it's just the place. It's a bloody-minded place where people get things done. And it's interesting. Small cities are kind of interesting. Small cities can be quite empowering. Big cities can be really overwhelming to the individual. London, New York. You have an idea, but you just know there's a hundred, there's a thousand other people who have the same idea. But in a small city, if anyone's doing something, you know. You know if there's a great coffee bar. You know if there's a good club. You know so, so if many scenes are built out of yeah, small places. You know if there's a hat shop. You know. Yeah. Right? Like, is there a hat shop in New York? Yeah. How many? I have no idea. But, you know, in a smaller city, is there a hat shop? Yes, there's a good one on Central Street. That's it. So, so that, Manchester is the place where, like, this scene is born makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, because you know it's worth doing. You know if someone is doing this thing that you're thinking of. You just know if they are. And if they're not, then do it. So in that sense, it's very empowering. And I think that factory records could only have happened in a smaller city like Manchester and possibly only in Manchester. Hey, everyone. Taking a quick break here to tell you a little bit about our season six sponsor, Le Cole School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. In addition to exhibitions, publications, research projects and public events, Le Cole offers a range of courses led by experts across jewelry, craft, history and the arts. Celebrating its first decade this year, Le Col, which has permanent campuses in both Paris and Hong Kong, plans to open a third space in Shanghai next year, and will soon open another in Paris, which will feature a public library of more than 7,000 reference works on jewelry and gems. At its main Paris space, Le Col is also opening a gemotech, or gem library, that contains some 1,200 stones for visitors to view and even handle. 
This year, they'll also be presenting six exhibitions in Hong Kong, Tokyo, and Paris, and publishing eight books. You can learn more about LeCole and its current and upcoming offerings at www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And now back to the episode. You have this rented space with FAC1, and then you do Hacienda. Well, yeah, they booked this venue, a very kind of marginal place called the West Indian Center in a difficult part of the city, yeah. the Moss side. And it was called The Factory, and I did the poster, and it was a venue. It was an altruistic gesture from Tony to help nascent bands get an audience. That was the start of it. For me, it was an opportunity to be part of the reality of a scene that I felt was important. And in contributing the poster for it, I was entirely free to do as I wished. There was no brief. These people are playing these dates, do as a poster. There was, I think I got paid 20 pounds. I mean, as I said, basically just do something. That kind of collective spirit that when you get together with friends and say, let's have a party, you know, I mean, no one bosses anyone around because, you know, you just join in together just to make something happen. If we just come back to time for a minute, I graduated from college in June 1978. And as I mentioned earlier, I procrastinated. I should have left immediately to find a job in London. I should have done that. To pursue graphic design, even in the context of music. I mean, to get a job, I would have to go to London. That's where the record labels were. But what a I mistake. procrastinated <laughs> just out of lying. Uh, and in the period that I procrastinated between June 78 and December 78, in that period, we founded Factory Records. And had I gone dutifully to get on with my life, I would not have been there when Tony sat with his friend Alan Erasmus and said, we need a label. But I was there. And I remember sitting with Alan and Tony in Alan Erasmus's apartment in Manchester in December 78, and Tony said some of the bands that have played at the factory do not yet have a record deal. Really? Who? Well, Cabaret Voltaire from Sheffield. Really? They're, but they're great. Don't know record deal. He said Joy Division. No record deal. And it was unbelievable to Alan and I that Joy Division and Cabaret Voltaire had not yet been offered or taken a record deal. So Tony said, why don't we do a record from the club? Even though it wasn't a club, it was a fucking name. Why don't we do a record? And that might help them get a record deal because if you have something on vinyl, then maybe that will help. So Alan said, yes, okay. He said, how are you going to pay for it? Tony said, I've got 5,000 pounds. My mother has left me. Well, 5,000 pounds, can you do it for that? Yes, you can. And of course I said, yes, because just selfishly, I said, yes, because it would be a record sleeve rather than a poster. And a record sleeve would go all around the UK rather than just like up in Manchester. So very selfishly, pure self-interest. I said, oh, it's a great idea. So in December 1978, Alan, Tony, and I founded what would become Factory Records. We had no intention of finding a label. We were just trying to be helpful. But we made the first record, which was a double seven-inch EP with Joy Division and Cabaret Voltaire and others on it. Pressed 5,000 copies. It was shocking to listen to. But in the supportive spirit of independence and the new wave, it sold out. And I understand that because I would buy independent records at that. You just buy them. Yeah. Just to be supportive of somebody being different, somebody being outside of the industry. And fact two, as it was known, sold out. And so Tony got the money back. Plus a bit. But most importantly, because I'd put 86 Palatine Road, an address on the back of it, Alan's apartment was inundated with demo tapes. The post office were delivering them in sacks. Wow. It was a new place to send your tape to. And by 79, we had factory records. It was not a company. It was really never a company. Tony never gave up his day job. We didn't get premises until the end, and that was, it was the end of it. It was an altruistic, not-for-profit venture. 
there were no contracts. The company would pay to make a record. And if there were any sales, it would recoup its outlay and then split any any profit. If there was a profit, it would split it 50-50 with the group. Just the same way that you would just sit down with friends and and just do a deal. Yeah. The phenomenal moment was that Joy Division were inundated with offers to sign to labels. And the man who called himself their manager, their friend, Rob Gretton, felt that there was something fragile about Joy Division and that they would not be able to sustain the brutality of a record deal and a record company. And when they had enough material to make an album, Rob suggested to Tony that it could be a factory album. I mean, this was a shocking idea to us. An album, I mean, okay, a couple of singles, something, help a group, you know, move on. But to actually make an album, wow, it's very developed. So, but we did. And they made, for a very modest amount of money, Joy Division made Unknown Pleasures. So Rob became a partner with the, Alan, Tony, and I. And Martin Hannett produced it, so he became a partner. And everybody did what they wanted to do. Factory became something that I've called the autonomous opportunity. It became a collective of free will. Which produced not only some of the greatest production, but one of the greatest record covers, which we should stop and talk about for a minute. Okay. Like, we're talking about a record cover that's probably been replicated. I know. It's insane. I know. I, I, I can barely countenance how many iterations there are. Bath towel. You know, it's just unreal. Oven gloves. Yeah. Unbelievable. Tattoos. Tattoos. Yeah, someone got a full tattoo on their back. Yeah, full, at least one person. Why do you think that image has resonated so strongly? It's, I mean, first and foremost, it's an extraordinary image. And earlier this year, I finally, I can't say I met, but I, I met with the originators of that image. Wow. Stephen Morris of Joy Division and I. braved up <laughs> to take part in a, uh, what should we call it, um, an astrophysics little um, lecture seminar with Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell, the astrophysicist who actually discovered the pulsar, which was going to be the first pulsar ever discovered, and a gentleman called Dr. Hal Kraft from Cornell, whose postgraduate experiments in the early 70s rendered the image itself. It was very intimidating for Stephen and I to meet them. It was like, definitely was like meeting the grown-ups. And the image, which is the pattern of the repeat signals from a pulsar, I mean, it's a very enigmatic sci-fi image. It's, there's something very sci-fi about it. It's over 50 years old now, but it's still strangely modern. And sci-fi is kind of like that. Data is like, data doesn't actually date. If you actually look at a graph, a graph is a graph. And it could be a graph from 1890, but I mean, it's a graph. A graph is a graph. And so somehow data just doesn't date. There's an enigmatic mystery to the meaning of that data and you look at it and you presume it's something. You know, you think it's a heartbeat or a sound wave or something or a landscape. Not a black hole. Well, no, no one, you know, no one realizes that And it's you didn't explain signal. it. There's no context no, on the record. No. Well, there wasn't needed. I mean, Bernard Sumner from Joy Division had found the image in the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Astronomy, second edition. He found it in Manchester Public Library one day and thought it looked great. And he showed the members of Joy Division, this is a cool image. And they all agreed it was a cool image. So when they came to be doing this album, they gave me the image with a kind of a brief, they'd like it black on the inside, white on the outside. And that was about it. And some, a track listing. But we all worked entirely autonomously at Factory because it was like a, not a job for anybody. There was, nobody was employed. Yeah. And most importantly, nobody had done any of it before. Tony was a news, a current affairs broadcaster. Rob had worked with an insurance company and was a DJ. But obviously the people in the, the young men in the groups had, you know, they had day jobs. 
Nobody had ever done it before. I had never designed a record sleeve before or poster. We were all entirely novices. And Martin Hanna had produced one single. So no one presumed to tell anyone else how to do it because they recognized that they didn't know and no one was being paid. So there was nobody in charge. You know, Joy Division had their material. They went in the studio and they recorded. Martin Hanna recorded it. And then legend goes, he told them to fuck off and he make it make a record. And Martin made Unknown Pleasures. And, you know, when I've seen in documentaries recently, both Bernard Sumner and Peter, they didn't like it. They thought they were making a punk record. They didn't really like Unknown Pleasures. So he made Martin, it coherent. Yeah. Martin made Unknown Pleasures. And I was given the visual material and I made the cover. And you hadn't heard the record? No, of course not. You never really do when you do record covers. It's a kind of sort of fantasy that people think you listen to the record. You never get to listen to the record until it's come out. You you listen at the same time the audience do. What was it like to hear that record for the first oh, time? It was bizarre. They gave me the material. I went to a studio where I was being allowed to use the equipment. To say that I was doing what I want was a little bit misleading or doing what I wanted. I realized on reflection, now I realized that I was doing what I wanted to have. That's what I did with Unknown Pleasures, and it's what I always do. I make a thing that I want to have. So I did it the way I wanted to have it, and also within the limitations of my capability at the time, which were very, my capabilities were very limited. So with very limited capability, I tried to make something that I would like to have. And I couldn't figure out how to put the title on the front. The enigmatic wave pattern was great. I was using reversal paper in the dark room just to see what it looked like, white out of black. And it was like amazing. So I thought, fuck it, I'm making it white out of black. I'm going to do this the way I think it would look good. So I decided to make it black. And I thought, well, it's space anyway. And lost in space. There's a lot of black space around the image. And I couldn't figure out how to put the type on it, Andrew. I couldn't put Joy Division on it. It kind of made it look like a record sleeve. And I didn't want it to look like a record sleeve. I wanted it to be a thing. A piece of art. And yeah. And anybody who was interested would know what it was. You know, young people never fail to find a record. You don't need to have a title on the front. I mean, no one has ever gone to a record store and said, I couldn't find it. They might not have it, but if it's there, you find it. And if they want the record, they're not buying it for the cover. No. No, that's true, which is also very important. But you would never give up and say, oh, I couldn't find it in the store. Come on. So I didn't put any type on it because I just couldn't figure out how to. And every time I tried, it just made it look like a record sleeve. So forget that. So I put all the type on the inside. And so it was done and it was late, you know, time again. I was should have probably done it days before, but then it was like midnight and somebody was probably saying, where the fuck is it? And I took it the next day to rob the manager's house as a piece of artwork, mechanical artwork. And uh, he said, oh, good timing, Peter. I just got a test pressing. I was like, oh, shit. He said, do you want to hear it? Well, I knew Joy Division. I'd seen them a few times, and I thought it was 40 minutes. It's going to be quite a difficult 40 minutes. But I couldn't, I obviously, I couldn't say no. So I said, yes, of course. So tentatively, I sat down, like in a comfy chair in Rob Gretton's living room, and he put on Unknown Pleasures. What Martin Hannett had done was just fucking transformative. It was phenomenal. It started brilliantly and it continued. I mean, it started and I just thought this record, this album can't keep this up. And it did. It's an amazing record. I mean, it's a masterwork, Unknown Pleasures. It's phenomenal. And I just sat there thinking, wow. And looking across at the table where the artwork was. And it's, this is like early 79, and I was still 23. You know, and I was buying music then and listening, and I knew that this is one of the greatest records of the moment. And thinking that you've done the cover of what is going to be one of the great records of the moment was quite, it was quite an extraordinary feeling. And I left Rob's that day just thinking, I hope that it does become it. I mean, it deserves to be a, let's see what happens. Anyway, it did. 
people still who are talking about it 40 Three, four, Do you think that feeling of knowing that it's a hit happens for you visually as well? With albums, it's difficult because they're not as such a hit. But songs, songs, I, I've actively witnessed it a couple of times. So I think possibly the last ever performance of Joy Divisions that I was at, at the University of London, in early 80s, something like that. They played a song. Ian suddenly had this white Vox Phantom guitar around his neck and he stepped out and they played a song that nobody in the hall had heard and I'd never heard it. And it was called Level Terrors Apart. <laughs> and like, you just know you know, immediately you have this like progressive bands and the music is interesting and sometimes it's difficult. But if you stick with it, you get to like it, et cetera, et cetera. But hits are hits. The first phrase of that song. Yeah. Is, I mean, it's perfect within, you know, within 30 seconds. You, this is a hit. I experienced it again around about this a similar time with orchestral maneuvers in the dark. Andy, who I was in a way closer to at the time than the members of Joy Division. Andy McCleskey and I were always sort of friends from the very beginning. And he said, he said, there's this melody that Paul and I keep whistling and it's really, it's really irritating us. We hate it. And he said, I, I, but, you know, we'll try to make it into something. And that was Enola Gay. And, you know, the first time I heard him play Enola Gay, again, same thing, that's a hit. So it doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter how obscure, difficult, or alternative they are. If they chance upon a, it's a song, it's a melody, it's a riff, it's a hook, and they're hits. Do you find that visually when you look at something? Do you know that that visually something is going to work sometimes, or not? Sometimes. Sometimes. In the case of Power Corruption Lies. With Power Corruption Lies, I liked the, it, that started as a postcard and I liked the postcard. I went looking for a Machiavellian character, gave up and bought a postcard of flowers. And I liked them. Now, there were sometimes, I mean, you know, I have worked with some great people and Trevor Key, the photographer who I worked with, occasionally you peel a Polaroid and you think, wow. I remember when we photographed Peter Gabriel in 1987 for the cover of So. And we did that on Polaroid roll film. I don't know if you ever experienced it, but Polaroid roll film was really exciting. It was, it was great material. And I remember seeing a frame of Peter. We'd started the day on Hasselblad and it was not good. And we'd, exper we'd experimented with the Polaroid roll film with New Order a few months earlier for Low Life and it had been really helpful and productive. And I just said, Trevor, put the Hasselblad away. Can we get the roll film out? And he went, mm. You know what photographers are like? Larger format, larger format, larger format. Said, Sometimes it doesn't work. I said, I said, Trevor, just look. This is difficult for Peter. He doesn't so really want to. get the camera in the right place. Yeah, Peter Gabriel never wanted to be photographed. He always wanted to be like stand behind a tree or something. Yeah. And the woman, the wonderful woman who was managing it at the time, Gail Coulson, she said, Peter's made a great album. You've got to bring him out. You've got to, don't let him stand behind a tree. And he had, so is an extraordinary record. And so we got the Polaroid roll from her. And I remember looking, at, you know, it would wind it through and you'd look. I saw that picture of Peter Gabriel as the cover of So, and I thought, okay, we got it. So you do sometimes see an image and you know you've got it. And the great things with digital and Polaroid, is you don't need to carry on. That's the wonderful, you've got it, you've got it. I mean, okay, we'll do a couple more rolls, but we really don't need to. So you do with images, but you also have to be careful. When it's someone else's work, it's easier. When it's your own work, you do have to be careful to not just be self-convincing. There's things I've done that I've thought people will like and they didn't work and other stuff that you, you know, not so fond of and they really love it. So, I mean, who knows? Yeah, but this idea of belief in self yeah. and belief in one's ideas, yeah, how conviction can be kind of misunderstood. And, and one of the things I was very curious about talking to you about is this possibly what you've learned over the years about how misunderstood creative people are. I mean, it kind of gets misconstrued as arrogance when really it's a requirement to have a conviction in the idea. Yes. You do have to strongly hold on to a thread of why and what you're doing. I mean, sometimes it's like green lights all the way. You know, you meet somebody who commissions a piece of work and they understand. 
But more often than not, it's not like that at all. There'll be a green light and then there'll be a few red lights. And, and you have to either persevere following your own conviction or be open-minded and realistic enough to know that somebody else's point of view is relevant and that you are not necessarily right. I remember Trevor Key, the photographer, said to me one day, he said, have you noticed we only really learn when we make mistakes? And I was like, Trevor <laughs> And I thought about it for a moment, and you're right. It's actually when something goes wrong that you sit down and say, what did we do wrong? Did we miss there? What did we do wrong? And when you establish what you what went wrong, you've learned, and you don't do it again. So all the time you have your own way is not necessarily good for you. It is good to be, to stop, either stop yourself and think, or as we know, in commissioned work, someone else often stops you. And sometimes they're right. You have to be accept the fact that sometimes they're right. But if they're not, then you have to have the conviction to press on. And if you're lucky, you will be proved right ultimately. I want to get back to 83 when you yeah. made New Order's Power Corruption Lies, because I don't want to graze over that. I think the story is well known. I mean, you saw the image, you applied it, but what maybe is not as well known is this idea of codes, which is mm. really when it was starting. And there's a relationship to computers at that time. This was the beginnings of coding. Yes, but it was not a relationship which I personally had. I mean, it was about time, that cover. And the kind of juxtaposition of the industrial and the cultural again. I knew I wanted to use a historic work, but I wanted somehow to make it relevant. So the kind of past, present, future, I quite like this. I, I still have a kind of a holistic sensibility about culture. The idea of abandoning a period wholesale when you move on to the next one, which was perhaps a little bit of a 20th century trait. Maybe it was a kind of a modernist trait. I don't know. But it somehow sort of seemed wrong to me that actually there were some things that you could move on from, but there were also some wonderful things. Perhaps it was desirable to have, you know, what you might call a collage or a melange of things. There's the now, and there's the last week, and there's the last century, and there's, the, you know, that the actually... There's a stability to Yeah, that. this is the, a holistic sense about civilization. And it always impressed me the most when I would go somewhere that recognized that there was history as well as, you know, today. The opening of 2001. Yes, totally. And that's normal now. We take this for granted. Whereas actually 60s and 70s, there was some aspects of our culture that was in a way just abandoning the previous in a headlong rush into the, like, the next. A response to World War II, a sort of trauma. Yes, there's probably a lot of reason behind the way things were. But certainly, as we just go back to the beginning, to that post-60s moment in the early 70s, there were a lot of things that I began to discover through the sort of canon of art and design that just were not around anymore. And I, I was frustrated by that and thought they ought to be around. So in 83, I was still interested in the idea of the relevance of the previous to the now. But I was interested in the juxtaposition of the two. And there was an awareness of a computer, but I did not have a computer. You know, the Macintosh design computer was not going to arrive until 1989 in my studio. So, you know, I had a fantasy about computers in the same way that I had a fantasy about the industrial city. It was a kind of romance about it. And one of the things I began to think about was archival retrieval systems and that in museums these days, then, they probably had a computer archive. And I had no idea what that would be. But there would be a screen and stuff would come up on the screen. So whether it was a Greek artifact or an impressionist painting or whatever, it would come up on a screen. And I was just curious about that because I thought, this piece of Greek antiquity has never been on a screen before. This 12th century wood icon has never been on a screen before. It's been in a photo and it's been printed on a page. In a, it's never been on a screen before. 
And on that screen, there will be some computer stuff. There will be some of the hieroglyphics and information. You know, we will all seen like science fiction films. So I kind of fantasized about historic works in this entirely new context of a computer screen, even though I didn't really know what a computer screen was yeah. beyond a movie. And I was curious about that. And I was looking for a historic painting for Power, Corruption, and Lies. I was looking for the wrong thing. As I said, I was looking for a portrait of Machiavelli. And the end ended up with a bunch of flowers. But I knew that I wanted to juxtapose it with some kind of code, some kind of computer code. Well, I didn't have any computer code. And that was kind of, you know, because it wasn't on a computer screen. It was going to be printed. And I thought, well, I don't really want to litter this with gratuitous hieroglyphics or information. What have I got? Okay, well, it's by New Order and it's called Power, Corruption, and Lies. So I thought, okay. So, so I had to take the actual information that existed that was pertinent to the thing, so the reality of the thing, and turn that somehow into a code. So I had to turn words into a code, which meant I had to turn the alphabet into a code. And so, you know, I sat down with some colored pencils and a piece of graph paper, squared graph paper, and tried to come up with a code for the alphabet. And I thought, can I have like 26 colors? And I thought, hmm. Limitations of four color process printing, 26 colors, it's getting a little bit sort of difficult to distinguish. I could come up with 10 colors. I could come white. I could white's white. I could come up with maybe nine distinctly different colors within the limitations of printing. And, uh, you know, numbers are numbers and like well, A is number one and Z is 26. So I could use numbers to be letters. and blah, blah. So I kind of worked out a color code for the information that was pertinent to the thing. And that was really fun, Andrew, because then having decided the, the code, the color code for A to Z, I then started to try out words. So, you know, like new order, power, corruption, blue Monday. Well, it was nice, first of all, to see this, um, what can we call it? Random sequence color field painter. It's beautiful. And the colors, the juxtaposition of and the sequence of colors would come up as per the nature of the word. So the word would become a color composition and not a color composition that I determined. It was the fact that it was determined by the, the formula because that's nice. If you have to try and decide, should I put pink next to blue or should I put the yellow in between? You could spend the rest of your life trying to decide about that. So this was determined per the formula. So I didn't, once I had the formula, I didn't need to have to question the composition. So it just was what it was. And that was really satisfying. It was great to see it. And when then that got juxtaposed with the Fantan Latour, the juxtaposition was fascinating. Mm -hmm. Neither of the two things were the same anymore. They were both different by virtue of being in context with each other. And this idea of appropriation only works when something sort of respected brought to it. Yeah, I had to see it a different way. And without a doubt, the Fantan Latour became different when it had this subtle coding down the edge of it. But then it's like so long ago now, and I've seen it so many times that it doesn't almost doesn't look right without it. Yeah. I mean, next month I'm been invited to the National Gallery where the painting is to give a little brief talk about the relationship with the painting. And when I see the painting without the color code on, it looks unfinished to me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, anyway, and then I, you know, I mean, the kind of weird sort of phenomenon about it is there was nothing really to, I didn't give the code away, but I did create this color wheel on the back. There's a sort of Apollonian Dionysian front. There's the kind of romantic florid front. And then there's the strict kind of almost technical back. And when I said earlier about it being biographical, the Fantan Latour is the sort of chintz covered living room that I, you know, in my parents' home. The technical back is the sort of the industrial landscape of the Northwest where that comfortable home was. It's this juxtaposition of the two. And I like them both. I like both of those dimensions and with power corruption lies they're not blended they're just juxtaposed against one another and i like that juxtaposition and on the back i did a color wheel of the painting and of the printing inks used to create the work and around the outside i did a subdivision of 26 parts the a to z of the code but without saying anything 
And I kind of thought that that was sort of adequately enigmatic and maybe one day somebody might figure it out. Within a week of release, so immediately there were two letters to the music press pointing out the spelling mistake on the album. <laughs> I thought, Fuck. Spelling mistake within color. In the laying of tints for the color code, there was a spelling mistake. And ironically, it was the word corruption. There were two P's and one R rather than two R's and one P. I hadn't noticed because the proof came back. It just looked great. But the New Order factory, Joy Division, the fans were so curious and so inquisitive that they had decoded the 26th part key, like, immediately and observed that there was a spelling mistake in the colors, which I then had to correct on the next run of the print. After which I never, you know, I never underestimated the potential of New Order fans from that point. I mean, they are forensic yeah. in their inquiry around the content of the work. But the color code, I loved that color code. And it's one of the things that you know, I get frustrated about it. There was a lot of things I could have done with that color code. I mean, if I was a painter, I probably would have spent the rest of my life just doing color field painting based on language. And it was one of the frustrating things of the nature of the work, the media, this, you know, I had this entirely autonomous medium at Factory, which is unprecedented in communication inside. I mean, no one, that never happens. If you work in graphics, it's not your work. You're not the author of the work. It is a service it is incumbent upon you to successfully deliver the information that is required by others to the audience specified by others. It is not your work. And this, you know, unfortunately, this is something of an illusion that students who go to study graphics, because graphics is so entry level, visual arts, all teenagers love graphic things because it's easy to get. And over the last few decades, more and more kids have gone to do graphics and the imagining that it's about them and it's not about you. Which you learned in 1990. Yeah, I learned, well, I learned the hard way a few times, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, it was evident to Malcolm Garrett and I before we left art school that that's actually what it was. Right. And that's why we, you know, we kind found of... Found a way around we, it. We found a way, we said, well, it doesn't matter at the moment because we're going to do record covers where there was more freedom. And there's a degree of freedom with record covers, but you are conventionally with a group being the art director of the decision maker in that group or that performance. That's it. So it's still a service. All of the covers that I've done, except Joy Division and New Order, have been for the person whose record it was, because it's their record. And actually, you know, you do have to accept it. ultimately it's their cover. Whereas the situation, it started with Joy Division. After Unknown Pleasures, and they made their second album, but they got busy. Yeah. And whereas they'd had time to find that amazing wave diagram for Unknown Pleasures, bands get busy and they don't have time anymore. So next time around, they came to me to say, what have you got? Mm -hmm. And from that came closer. And then Ian Curtis died, leaving a permanent democracy in New Order. Now, had Joy Division continued, unwillingly, not by his choice, Ian would have become the kind of default leader of Joy Division because it's just what happens. There's a hierarchy that forms around He's an in individual and a group. And whether they want to be the main man or not, they become the main man. You know, the press, management, the audience, the audience, the fans make that person. And that would have happened with Joy Division, but Ian died and it didn't, so it never happened. And New Order continued without, reinvented themselves without Ian as a democracy. And throughout the 80s, there was no single member of Joy Division who of New Order who was more important than other member of Joy Division. Which is a pain in the ass for you. Well, it was a pain in the ass for them a lot of the time because yeah. it was difficult to get anything decided. But it was also very beautiful. It was very beautiful that they were a group and not just one person's outfit. But when something had to be decided then that was, could sometimes be difficult because there was a three or four, and then Gillian joined the group and there were four points of view. So for me, you know, I soon witnessed a culture of disagreement develop between the four of them, just on principle. So not meaningful disagreement, but just bloody minded in principle, I will disagree with him because I feel like it. 
So it meant that even though I would try to get their consensus on something, sometimes it was impossible. And so it defaulted to me to make the decision. And so what happened with New Order was that they would make their records and I would do the covers. And there was no one for me to show the work to, to approve it. So in certain occasions, it went from me to the printer without anyone seeing it. Blue Monday is a perfect example of that. And they didn't necessarily like it. But there was always someone who liked it as someone who didn't like it and somebody who didn't mind it. And they were tolerant and it was kind of like family. So it was like family. You might not like the way your auntie does the Christmas tree, but she does the Christmas tree, so you live with it. It was a bit like that. So for a graphic artist designer to have mass production at their disposal without any gatekeeper. It's amazing. It doesn't happen, doesn't it? It does. It never happens. It never happens. Yeah, ever. So even if you ask me today to do a logo uh, for, for Time Sensitive, you're still going to want to see it before it goes live, before it goes on. You're still going to want to like it. Yeah. That's the nature of, it's a service. That's the nature of graphic design. You know, so throughout the 80s, I had this unprecedented situation where I was able to create work. And in the case of things like Blue Monday, it actually went to millions. Yeah. And Blue Monday is a phenomenal one because it is actually a commercial product in that people bought it, but it has nothing written on it. There's nothing written on it at all. It is devoid almost of information. And I've seen figures as big as 2 million for Blue Monday. And the idea that 2 million things were transacted without any information or branding or any kind of concession. Incredible. So, so that period, that period ends 1990. Yeah shows up the economy is terrible yeah your exactly. own studio the factory not in great condition and you make this sort of unlikely decision to move to la and join pentagram no it's slightly the other way around the facts are correct in the latter part of the 80s i was running the studio like an art project and imagine that any day now it would somehow magically become art and that Somehow, art would save me. Because it had. Well, Why would you think there any was, different? There were some encouragements as well. There was, my friend Robert Longer was very supportive, a particular of some work that I'd done, and I had a meeting here in New York with his gallery Metro. I kind of thought any moment I will magically make some transition into art, and I will be able to make the work as art rather than as print, and it'll all be fine. Anyway, and it wasn't. That, that, that magic moment didn't happen. And by, you know, by 1990, my so-called studio was insolvent. I mean, I was doing work as if there was no tomorrow. And there was no accountability between the time we spent and what we were being paid. So we ran out of money. And the rest of the world ran out of money at that round about that time as well. You know, the kind of the credit, easy credit of the 80s came to a standstill the way it was to happen again in the 2000s. And owing money in 1990 was a very bad place to be. And the esteemed design partnership, Pentagram, who had been founded in London in 1972 and then, then it expanded to New York and also to San Francisco. Um, I went and talked to a man, one of the partners of Pentagram, about the predicament. And he proposed that perhaps I could become a partner of Pentagram and start to learn something. So it came to pass that in 1990, I became a partner of Pentagram in London and became the eighth partner in London. And there were... 15 partners altogether around the world. And actually for the two years, it was a probationary two-year period as a partner of Pentagram. In the two years, I learned a lot. For the first time, learned from some grown-ups how you run a design firm and the accountability of time. And I kind of learned enough to know that I didn't really want to do that. But I did learn how to. Well, I got insight how to. I didn't really acquire the know-how how to, but I could see how you're supposed to do it. 
And I learned a lot from those guys. They were, they were all together were 15 highly experienced partners of Pentagram. And they were all independent. That's how Pentagram works. It's a sort of a partnership like a law firm. And there's a lot to learn from experienced others. You know, I was 35. The average age of the partners was like 55. So I was learning from, you know, people who had been doing it for a lot longer than I had. And some things are timeless. Some professional practice is timeless. But after two years, it was quite clear that I was not really going to conform. And I didn't really like the idea of converting a fee into time. So there is a $10,000 budget for this, and that equates to three days. And so whatever you do will be done in three days. And if possible, do it in two, because there's nothing wrong with a profit. But everything you'd done up to that point just kind of it, it, occurred it, when it needed to It didn't occur. really fit in working that way. Yeah. So Pentagram and I were not destined comfortably to continue. So in 93, Brett Wickens, who worked with me as my kind of senior assistant, even, even in a way my kind of partner in the work we were doing, Brett and I left Pentagram and we went to Los Angeles. We'd been in LA for like a month in 92, working on a television channel ident for a youth education program called Channel One. It was a youth news program initiated by the Whittle Corporation. And a very kind of progressive man called David Newman, who was the producer director of it. And he was a factory fan. And he thought it'd be kind of interesting to have factory graphics for this youth news network idea. So it was whilst we'd been still at Pentagram, Brett and I spent a month in Los Angeles doing a TV network ident. And like all visitors and particularly Europeans, Brett was Canadian, but I was a European who kind of spend a few weeks working in LA, you think this is great. You stay in the Sunset Marquee Hotel, and there's a car downstairs in the parking lot, and there's a pool, and you you know, you know, have eggs Benedict before you go to work, and you come back and you have a swim, and you think this is life in LA. You think this is great. We ought to move to LA. Of course, it's not like that, but you know, like you kind of mistakenly think that if I live in LA, it would be like a holiday job. So, you know, we thought if things go wrong in London, we might, come back. And there was a lot of like, you guys should stick around. Anyway, things did go wrong in London. We left Pentagram. And we had a concept about what was called new media at the time. So this is 93. And Brett and I witnessed it in LA. What we witnessed was the pool of talent. Brett was very computer orientated. And we talked about how much what was being called new media might change the practice of communications design. And we thought, okay, well, photographers are going to give way to cameramen. Typography is going to give way to a voiceover. Models will give way to actors. Communications design is heading towards becoming a motion image experience. And if that is the case, there is an enormous pool of talent in Hollywood that is not working all of the time. Yeah. And that Hollywood could be a very smart place to have a communications agency if communications are going screen-based. It's actually quite, quite observant. Very objective, yeah. yeah. And we knew that the guys at Pentagram were not interested in that at all. They were still waiting for us to give up our even our computers. But we knew there was a company here in New York that might be interested, and it was a company called Frankfurt Bolkind, who were technically very progressive. So in the last days of Pentagram, or when we left Pentagram, we came to New York and had a meeting with a man called Aubrey Bolkind, and who ran Frankfurt Bolkind. And he was very technically savvy and interested. And we put this idea to him. And he said, you may have something there. I have a studio in LA. Why don't you go there and try it out? So Frankfurt Bolkind wonderfully supported Brett and I to relocate from London to LA. Unfortunately, Aubrey didn't really get time to brief the LA office who were predominantly doing movie posters. So Brett and I found ourselves a little bit like fish out of water in a studio that didn't really know why we were there. Brett was ultimately able to make himself very useful because he was technically yeah. proficient and he sat down and just, you know, got on and helped Frankfurt Bolkine produce movie posters. And I was just utterly irresponsible. I was like a loose cannon. I just went and drove around LA every day uh, looking for furniture and uh, working out how you live in LA, waiting for my 
AOOA visa to come through, given a credit card from the company because I could not be officially employed, and basically appeared to be completely out of control, according to Aubrey. And in some ways, on reflection, I was a bit out of control, but I learned a lot about LA. And um, and you go back to London. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was quite clear that it was kind of clear that I was not going to conform to fit in with the company. Brett stayed and I didn't. I was down and out for six months in Beverly Hills, which was interesting. I'd stayed another six months with no money, as in no money, no checking account, no credit card, no money. The first time ever in my life with no money and no family immediate family to turn to. And it's quite interesting, when you have no money, very quickly you have no friends to turn to. People lend you $20. They say, but what are you going to do tomorrow? And that was good for me, but it was not exactly enjoyable. So I had a difficult few months down and out in Beverly Hills. That was a really important moment. And in Beverly Hills one afternoon, I looked at the houses on the way to Rodeo Drive and I looked at the stores and I was like 38, 39 years of age. I thought, it's actually, this is not really what I want. If I stay here and I'm successful, actually, it's not really what I want. These are not the stores I want to go to and these are not the homes that I want if I'm ever successful enough to be able to buy one. So at that point, I realized that my long-term sense of self did not belong in in Los Angeles, and I realized that I should leave before it was too late. If you stay there too long, you will never cut it. And what's interesting is the next home you make Mm -hmm. becomes this iconic, very important space. Oh, the apartment are you thinking of? In Mayfair. Okay, so I went back to London. I was kind of, you know, I was sort of homeless in London for a few months. Eventually made friends with a wonderful young German art director called Mike Murray who had a very successful company in Cologne. And Mike was very supportive and he came to London frequently to buy art and we decided that we could do a place together. So Mike's company provided the the capital for what become known as the apartment, which was like a 2000 square foot Mayfair salon where I had the benefit of living and Mike would visit and we were supposed to work there together, you know, and his brother, who was the financial director of the company, hoped that we would, but we would just go shopping or talk about art. So it worked beautifully for two or three years, but it didn't really go anywhere. So ultimately we had to, we had to pull the plug on that. And after the 1990 recession, there was a phenomenal transformation that happened in the culture of London. The YBAs appeared, you know, the the new young British art movement happened. And it happened in a kind of lull after the recession. That New York, as the established center of contemporary art, was somewhat disrupted by the 91-92 recession. And a little bit almost in freeze frame. And actually, in London, the young artists in London were the first ones out from that. Totally. And partly because they didn't have anything anyway. So they were used to not having anything. And there was something very vital and urgent about that work they did. And it was kind of like life and death. Damien's work in particular. Uh, Mark Quinn did this remarkable... The blood head sculpt- Yes, of know. his own blood. In, Tracy in Emin frozen. was doing all that work. Tracy Emin, my, this is my life, you know, for better or worse, this is my life. It was really about their, it was about life and death. It was about their life. It was not about anything other than that. And it was phenomenal. And this was all happening in London. I remember distinctly, it was like the summer of 94. There was a show at the Serpentine in Hyde Park, and it was called Some Went Mad, Some Ran Away. Mm-hmm. And Damien Sheep, in formaldehyde was there. And I remember leaving that thinking, thank God. Thank God I have got back here in time to know and connect with this thing that was happening. In the mid-90s, London seemed to be the most vital place, an urgent place to be. It was really important to be in London in the mid-90s to feel, to understand this, that I'd be part of it. And then what I began to realize was that Many of this new generation of artists were the teenagers who had grown up on your work. 
But there's a period from then to now with an enormous amount of work, your collaborations with Raf Simmons, your work, you know, on the, uh, redoing the Burberry logo, all of these things that have come out of this period of, of the middle. And so as a final thing, I just, I'd love to hear from you what that period, that fallow period in the middle where you did feel untethered gave you. Well, I didn't know what to do with myself. Because I was in this fascinating position. You know, people say, oh, you're a designer, you're an artist. Oh, it's really interesting. You're between art and design. Well, it is very interesting being between things, but you're like everything and you're everywhere and nowhere. It's not easy being between things because you are neither one thing nor another. You know, are you a pop star or an actor? Well, maybe you're neither. It can be a non-place. As well as being very interesting and very rich, it's also a non-place. And in that kind of like nascent period of having a professional career as a designer it was a bit of a non-place i didn't really want to do it and i was not clearly identifiable you could take the signals from my work and apply it to the world and many were doing that if you felt inclined to do it it's just that i didn't really feel inclined to do it i did the work because i thought that i needed to and and, and i thought it was the world needed to see it i didn't do it because it needed to sell more jeans yeah and I'm actually not very good at doing work for that reason. Between 90 and 2010, so there's a 20-year period where I explore different things and I'm like looking for a way to be me. I mean, during that period, Nick Knight and I founded Show Studio. You know, it seemed to me in the late, towards the end of the late 90s that fashion was becoming a, a motion image issue. And I sat with Nick one day and I said, we should create a website because we will escape the tyranny of clients and publishers and websites, just do the things we want to do. And Nick was just brilliant and totally supportive of it and made it possible and has continued with Show Studio brilliantly. Day, it's incredible. And, you know, we were right. You know, fashion was going to become a motion image thing. It's just that I didn't... I was interested in it theoretically. I don't really want to make films of handbags, though. So that's the problem. So it was difficult for me. The interesting thing that has happened in the last 10 years is that the generations who were informed and inspired or motivated, whatever I can modestly say, by the work that I had the opportunity to do, they have become now decision makers in their respective places and professions. So Raf Simmons was like probably, you know, was inspired by Moe when he was young, when he was on the way. But when he finally got here, as the new creative director of Calvin Klein. He was then in a position to call me and say, the Calvin Klein identity needs updating. You come and do it. And it was Raf's decision. Raf did not have to convince some old guy who can give a fuck who I was to get some Brit to do it. Raf made the decision. And this has been the case for the last few years. It was Ricardo Tichy. He said, I want Peter Saville to do Burberry. Yeah. And in each case, Marek Reichman at Aston Martin asked me to redo the Aston Martin badge last year. The creative individuals who kindly have a regard for me, they are now able to make the decision in their organization or their context and ask me to do the work without me having to validate myself in some of the kind of conventional metrics of communications design. And that's been great because it's meant that I have been able to choose things that I wanted to do and that I didn't mind doing. And, and I'm validating towards the choices you made yeah, to get here. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not running a studio, so I do not have the overhead of a studio. I live in what was my studio. So I have to, you know, it's important for me to have a significant project each year. I have companies like Quadrat who are incredibly supportive and modestly retain me, which is really helpful. And I can pick and choose what I do. But when I do do something now, it's somehow now legendary status so i don't have to argue now about a value i don't have to sit and have a hard nose yeah, talk the about the price for something more often than not there is a degree of respect to me when i go in to do a job i go in as the famous peter savile and clients are respectful of that and it's very difficult to get to that point. Of course. Well, the only way it happens, I think, is laid out in the last hour people have listened. Okay, thank you. 
So on that, thank you for coming in today, Peter. Andrew, this was yeah, a true pleasure. We, could, um, we should probably do part two another time. Extra thanks to our season six sponsor, Le Col School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. A unique place for learning, Le Col welcomes the general public to the world of jewelry through courses, conferences, exhibitions, videos, and book publications. You can find more about Le Col at www.lecolvancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And thank you for listening. You can find more episodes of Time Sensitive on our website, timesensitive.fm, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can listen to our other podcasts at a distance by heading to atadistancepodcast.com. You can follow us on Instagram at slowdown.tv. And if you like our programs, please be sure to subscribe and leave comments. Our theme music was composed by Billy Martin. This episode was produced by Ramon Broza, Emily Jang, and Johnny Simon. 